first joined the Green Party back in 2012, for the same reason many others do, out of a growing concern for the gravity of our climate and ecological crisis. And when I joined, I honestly believed it was possible to eliminate fossil fuels with renewables alone. I didn't take any issue at all with one of the party's core tenets, its opposition to nuclear energy. With the impacts of our climate emergency becoming ever more frequent and extreme, I have found myself wrestling with my party's position on nuclear power. And I found myself wondering, what if we're wrong? What if renewables alone won't be enough? And what if our opposition to nuclear energy is actually a hindrance to climate action? Nuclear energy is a deeply polarising issue amongst environmental groups and political parties. It strikes both fear and optimism into those who want to protect the planet most. I wanted to understand when nuclear and environmental activism first became entwined. So I went back to the beginning, the first use of the atomic bomb. could be seen going higher and higher. I watched in silence as the mushroom cloud rose above Hiroshima, Japan. It was 1945 and the US had, in a single moment, caused devastation on a scale previously unimaginable. Tens of thousands died in the blast, and more still at Nagasaki just three days later. The bombs had demonstrated the power of splitting the atom. Within a month, the war was over. Now there was overwhelming joy and thankfulness. All through the night, London celebrated. The post-war period saw some countries embarking on an arms race to ensure that they were not left disadvantaged by this new military power. In the space of 46 years, the USA alone conducted more than 1,000 nuclear weapons tests. The world faced the real possibility of annihilation for the first time. Across from the White House, demonstrators against nuclear testing are led by a Nobel Prize winning scientist, Dr. Linus Pauling. A surge of protest movements sprang up, united in their aim to protect planet Earth from this new threat. And it turned out to be the biggest ever protest against the peaceful use of nuclear power. The rally, organised by the Friends of the Earth, launches a week of anti-nuclear action throughout Britain. The demonstration against the... Being anti-nuclear and pro-environment were, at that time, one and the same. Following the same anti-nuclear sentiment of the early environmental groups, in 1990, the modern Green Party emerged after various iterations in organisation. Today, the party rightly remains opposed to nuclear weapons, but still also to nuclear energy. But as we face catastrophic climate change, don't we need every tool in the box to fight it? I think the climate crisis is existential. It is that bad. It's 
I've heard people say, you know, that it's alarmist, but I think we should be alarmed. I'm very concerned. Um, I, I think the action we need to be taking right now is simply not happening. I think the government are uh, dragging their heels. I think the impact that we're going to have on climate change in the Western world is being underestimated. I think being a parent does make the, the idea of, you know, how the planet is going to be for, for future generations much more immediate. Um, I mean, it's something that, that we all care about. But I think when it becomes about your family, you know, and you think about your children and potentially one day grandchildren and what their standard of living is going to be like and um, how, how the planet will be for them, um, that makes it very real. In 1985, 64% of global electricity production came from the burning of fossil fuels. 35 years later, in 2020, this share was still 61%, with renewables replacing lost nuclear capacity more than they did fossil fuels, switching one low-carbon power source for another. Despite impressive growth in renewable energy, our use of fossil fuels has continued to rise. And so, carbon emissions and global temperatures continue to climb. In 1800, the world emitted 28 million tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels. By 1900, this had increased to 1.9 billion tonnes and in 2019, it was over 36 billion tonnes. 40% of this was to produce electricity. It is shocking to think that despite so many warnings over the years, we continue to use more fossil fuels than ever before. The more I looked into it, the clearer it became. We are still living in the golden age of coal, oil and gas. The consequences of our continued use of fossil fuels are already all around us. I've got children of my own. They, within their lifetime, they'll see a humanity crisis unless governments pick up the pace of their action on climate change. The climate emergency has become so much more pressing um, than it was. Um, I think one of the things that even the, the, the Green Party perhaps hasn't fully come to terms with yet is, is actually the scale of the problem that we're facing. When you look at the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the Keeling curve just goes up and up in an unbroken chain. And so the realism part is to look at that and to realise what the implications are. And the implications are radical. I wanted to learn more about how serious the situation was and what action was being taken. The Global Climate Conference, COP26, was taking place in Glasgow. So I decided to go there and speak to some of the delegates attending. Kevin Anderson, a highly respected climate scientist, agreed to meet me. Kevin had been the inspiration for me joining the Green Party, so I was keen to speak to him. Kevin. 
Kevin, oh, good to see you. And you too. Come in. How are you doing? Oh, very well, thanks. And yourself? Yeah, yeah, not bad. Not bad. Thanks so much for coming in to speak to me today. Um, how pivotal is this conference for keeping below 1.5? Absolutely pivotal to stay below 1.5. But it's not this particular year. It should have been last year or the year before that or a decade before that. We would have to be incredibly lucky on our, what we call our climate sensitivity, about how the atmosphere responds to the carbon dioxide we put, it in, put into it, if we're to stay with 1.5. So we have to be pretty lucky on, what's, on the sort of science uncertainty for us to stay within 1.5 now. We're, we're probably going to breach that. We're at about 1.1 degrees centigrade of warming already. Some people say a little bit more, some a bit, bit less, but around about 1.1. We're going to be at 1.5 within 10 to 20 years. Um, we're not looking to curtail our emissions particularly rapidly. So as far as I can see, if we don't get some really very significant outcome from this, from this meeting that brings our emissions down globally, particularly of carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels, then we will fail on 1.5. But we will also make it much more challenging to actually stay below 2 degrees centigrade of warming. I mean, could you describe the consequences if we overshoot 1.5? Well, at two degrees centigrade of warming, I mean, if you think about some of our emblematic ecosystems like the Barrier Reef, people always think about that one. At two degrees centigrade, we pretty much wipe out the Barrier Reef, you know, almost all completely dead. But that's true for most of these sort of tropical corals. At 1.5, we probably still destroy maybe 75% of it. That's what the latest, the last report from the IPCC, the SR 1.5 report, um, yeah, emphasised, looked at looking at those impacts. But if you bring that a bit more to something that maybe we can more readily understand. If it's impacting our corals like that, think what it's doing to our insect communities. And what do the insect communities do? They pollinate our crops, so that affects our food. So you, you see all these sets of impacts occurring in, at human and at ecosystem levels, and you can imagine them playing out in things like human migration, as well as species migration as well. Um, and this it will exacerbate already tensions between some countries, you know, military tensions. So you see it playing out really across the portfolio of, of every area, area of human life, whether it's, it's food, it's migration, it's you know, drought, floods, uh, you know, all forms of infrastructure. So it's, it's sort of devastating impacts as far as I can see. And so you know, any, any moderately cautious person, you don't have to be really precautionary, but any a moderately cautious person would say we should be avoiding that. Yeah, avoiding at all costs. At all costs, you know, literally at all costs. You know, we should be doing everything we possibly can. And at the moment, we're, we're literally just tinkering at the edges. Most of the warming we've seen comes about from our use of energy, and that's basically from burning fossil fuels. So we have to rapidly move away from burning fossil fuels. We need to electrify a large part of our energy system. Currently, for most industrialised countries, and indeed for many of the industrialising countries, only about 20% of their final energy demand, as we call it, the energy we typically consume, comes from electricity. 80% of it comes from other sources, just typically like in the UK, for instance, gas for heating, or kerosene for our planes, or um, marine bunker fuel, you know, uh, diesel fuel for our ships. So that's the majority of the energy we use. So we're going to have to electrify a lot of uh, elements of our society. Our homes, our heating, our industrial practices, our transport are going to have to be made electrical. So do you, do you think there is a role for nuclear? Well, let's be clear, nuclear is, is low carbon. Its, its whole life cycle emissions are around about that of a lot of the renewables. From my perspective, the first thing we do is use much less energy. And the, in that, I mean the wealthy of us who, who use most of it today have to make big changes in how much energy we use. The next part is about efficiency, about making sure that everything we do is as, is as efficient as possible and that any money we save, we don't just spend it on more holidays and more jet skis. So we, we care, we're careful about what's called the rebound effect. And then we need to use, as, as, to me, go through the whole sort of portfolio of renewables, as many of those as, as we can get um, deployed as quickly as possible. But if there's a shortfall, then you think, well, what else do you provide that's, that's very low carbon? And nuclear certainly is low carbon. And in my view, and from some work I'm doing with one of my colleagues now, you could deploy it quite quickly as well. That morning's papers on COP26 weren't particularly encouraging. The challenges facing us seemed enormous. A member of the Finnish Green Party was here promoting nuclear. I invited her over 
to hear what she had to say. Hi, Taya, come in. Hello. Come in. Hi, Mark. How yeah. are you? Yeah, thanks for taking time to come over here. I'm very well. No How problem. How is it down there? Uh, oh, busy? <laughs> yes, Messy. very busy. Busy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, busy. Yeah, go upstairs. So how come you got to attend COP26? Well, I've been working full time on, on climate and environmental issues for the past six months. And I had the opportunity to come here and I thought it was very important because we we're running out of time. We're still pretending that we can exclude some very good proven um, options like nuclear. So I'm here to root for nuclear, basically, and to fight for my children's future. Yeah, so it's uh, quite unusual for Green Party member to be advocating for nuclear power, isn't it? Yeah, luckily um, not in Finland anymore. So I joined the Green Party just a few years ago. Before I couldn't, even though I've been an environmentalist for all my life. I'm a biologist. And people always ask me, why are you not in the Green Party? Because you're um, talking uh, about wolves, biodiversity, climate issues. And I told them because they oppose nuclear. But just within the last couple of years, um, they have changed um, their stance very quickly and are now technology neutral. And so I thought now I can, you know, join them. Do you think that the fact that the party takes an evidence-based approach it encourages more people to vote for them or, or join the party? At least among the young people, um, the young Greens are very pro-nuclear and the young climate activists in Finland in general are very pro-nuclear. We see this across all parties, um, that the youth section of the party is more pro-nuclear um, than the actual party. And so if we were anti-nuclear, for example, we would lose the young people's vote because they think we need all the tools available to tackle this crisis. Mm -hmm. The Finnish example shows that you can change your opinion about nuclear. It will not hurt you. It will not destroy your party. You will gain uh, new supporters. And most importantly, you will do the right thing for the climate, for the planet, for our future. Um, so I think it's a no brainer. I wondered about the Green Parties of the UK. Could they, like the Finns, be open to using every available tool to address the climate emergency? It was time to find out more about the possibilities of nuclear. No one energy source is perfect. Wind turbines have very low operating costs and no operational emissions but are intermittent and require a large area. Solar also has no operational emissions and even lower maintenance than wind, but it too is unpredictable and has a massive land footprint. Hydropower is reliable, but is expensive to construct and can have major impacts on ecosystems. Nuclear is low carbon and reliable but has expensive upfront costs, and issues of waste remain a problem with the public. I joined the Green Party in 2015, and I think it was, it was a growing realisation that the climate emergency is the greatest challenge of our generation. It's the, it's the greatest existential crisis facing humanity, and if we don't deal with that adequately, then very soon not much else is going to be very important. The Green Party fundamentally puts the environment and climate change at the centre of everything in its policy manifesto. Other parties just don't. It's, uh, it's another issue for them, along with health, along with education, along with crime. For us, it's, it's central and it affects everything else. We can't possibly meet the energy demands from 100% renewable energy, and that without nuclear, we will be burning more fossil fuels and our CO2 emissions will continue to rise. On my return from Glasgow, 
I recalled how Kevin Anderson had explained how critical it is that we electrify our world with low carbon power. He'd said that our electricity demand could easily increase by three or four times in the process. It's a mammoth undertaking. The logistics seem truly daunting. The UK has made great progress to almost eliminate coal and deploy renewables, wind in particular, but we still rely heavily on gas. Coal, oil and gas emit vast levels of CO2. Renewables and nuclear emit hundreds of times less. Nuclear is on a par with wind and solar. Biomass has the highest emissions of the renewables but its credentials as a renewable are contentious. The UK's electricity that is produced from biomass uses wood from clear-cut forests in North America. These are turned into pellets that are then shipped across the Atlantic to be burnt in power stations. I was becoming more persuaded about the potential of nuclear energy. I was invited to Sizewell B on the Suffolk coast. Colin Tucker, the nuclear safety officer, showed me around. So People worry about nuclear waste. It's one of the, thing, the, the main fears that people have uh, about nuclear electricity generating stations like Sizewell B. Yeah. So look behind me. In here, we've got uh, fuel. Touch it. Fuel. Yeah, touch it, go ahead. In there, fuel that used to be inside our reactor. And it's just the other side of this shielding. Now, put your hand down here. Can you feel a, a gentle breeze? Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. That airflow going into the shielding and around the cask is what's keeping that fuel cool. And it means you can safely store it in one of these casks for decades. Right, okay. Sometime later, if we need to take it out, put it in a different container, or we have a problem with this, we can do that. We can take the whole thing back and reverse it. And this is the really evil stuff, yeah? Well, this is, this is used fuel. Most of the radioactive hazard from a nuclear power station is locked up tight in that solid yeah. used fuel. Yeah. So providing you can manage that hazard appropriately, and here it is, it's safe, it's not affecting it's not anybody. Even warm. Not even warm. It's just a few kilowatts the other side of the shielding, very little. That's if amazing. you look down the line, you can see there's not very many casks, mm. and some of those at the end are empty. And how many years, how many years uh, of spent fuel is here? You're looking at spent fuel from six years of generating 3% of the country's electricity. Seriously? Yeah, it doesn't take up a lot of space, does it? Is that all? That's all. Um, 12 million tonnes of coal equivalent, if you, if you want it as an old wow. generator. Incredible. You get a good view from up there. Wow. Look at that. Industry doesn't have to be ugly. We don't take up a lot of space here. Um, but what we've got doesn't look too bad. Right. What you're looking at there is the reactor building. So the heat is made in our reactor in there. That gives us the steam. The steam goes to the turbine hall, drives the turbines, and means we can generate 3% of the country's electricity. Can this help us with climate change? This is already helping with climate change because we're not producing any CO2. Just over there is a reactor that is producing all of the heat that we use to make the steam, to drive the turbines, 
to put 3% of the country's electricity out on the grid. Right. And in doing that, we are not emitting any CO2. It's just not happening. Um, of course, there's CO2 goes into energy, goes into mining uranium, yeah. but we only use 25 tonnes of fuel a year um, and, and building the place. Well, you pay all that back in about six months of running a nuclear power station. So they make a huge contribution to avoiding burning fossil fuels. And that's what it's about, yeah. absolutely. All this power is generated here, in the vast space of the turbine hall. 3% of the UK's electricity, 24-7, for stretches of 18 months at a time. And it can do this because of the energy density of its fuel, uranium. One kilogram of coal can power a 40 watt bulb for six days. The same amount of uranium would power the same bulb for over 1,000 years. Despite being a low carbon and efficient means of energy production, the fear of nuclear continues to impact its acceptance. In 1979, the Three Mile Island accident in the US saw the beginning of a shift in public opinion around the safety of nuclear reactors. Nuclear's reputation took a seismic hit with the Chernobyl accident in Ukraine in 1986. Fears of nuclear resurfaced again in 2011 when an earthquake and tsunami led to the meltdowns at Fukushima. Whilst rare, these accidents have instilled fear of nuclear energy and led to the erosion of public confidence. I went to speak to Professor Jerry Thomas of Imperial College to get her views on the health impacts of nuclear accidents and the balance between fear and the science. You've been studying the health effects of the Chernobyl accident for quite some years now. Uh, can you tell me if there is a scientific consensus on how many people died and or how many people were affected in the years after? Yeah, there, there is a scientific consensus about the number of people who um, had problems after Chernobyl. And the, the basic findings are that 28 people died of acute radiation syndrome within weeks to months after the accident. These were people who had high doses of radiation. Um, and then um, in the cohort that had acute radiation syndrome, not everybody died. In those that have survived, there's been a further 19 deaths, and 14 of them actually went on to have children within five years. Of those who were involved in the cleanup, there are, there's an awful lot of interest in following those people up. Um, it is expected that some of those may develop cancer, but to date, there is no evidence that there is an excess risk of cancer in those who are involved in the cleanup, aside from those involved in the very early stages who had acute radiation syndrome. And what about Fukushima? Fukushima, absolutely nobody. And that, that is for two reasons. The radiation levels were much, much lower than Chernobyl. Uh, the, uh, the things that were put in place by the Japanese government limited exposure to young children from iodine. Uh, and the, the levels of iodine that we saw from Fukushima, we're not likely to see any increase in thyroid cancer because they were just simply too low. But unfortunately, because people were panicked and wanted to run away because they were so frightened of what might happen, Actually about, I think it's 1,800 people died as a result of the evacuation. People who evacuated from old people's homes who were evacuated without medical support or very sick people evacuated without the appropriate medical support. So actually the radiation killed nobody, but the fear of radiation definitely did kill people. So I heard that you used to be anti-nuclear. Absolutely was. So what changed? I think my light bulb moment in realising that I couldn't remain anti-nuclear was understanding how easily it is to relate dose and effect and understanding that dose from long-lived isotopes doesn't result in large doses to human tissue. And since dose and effect are completely linked, it was all of a sudden I realized that actually most of the dose from these long-lived isotopes that everybody fears is tiny. It 
it was becoming clear to me that it was the fear of nuclear, which for many countries had hindered the development of this technology. I'd learned that one of nuclear's greatest success stories lies just across the English Channel in France. In the 1970s, France embarked on an ambitious rollout of nuclear, building 56 reactors in just 15 years. Within a couple of decades, their emissions from electricity generation dropped dramatically. In 2020, 67% of France's electricity was generated from nuclear energy. 17% of that was from recycled nuclear waste. I wanted to know more about how nuclear waste is recycled. So I went to the Arano La Hague facility in France to find out. I was shown around by Sylvain Renouf, who explained the process. OK. Well, can you tell me what we're looking at here? Yeah, sure. So what you can see here, it's a used nuclear fuel, and uh, this fuel will be recycled into the plant, in the Orano La Hague plant. Uh, at the moment, we are cooling the fuel, uh, and once this fuel will be cooled, we will transfer it to a storage pond before uh, processing this fuel. So 96% of a nuclear used fuel is recyclable. We transfer it to a basket and the basket is then transferred into the pond, the storage into pond. Into the storage pond. Absolutely. Okay, and cool. I will show you the storage yeah. can pond. We, can we have a look at that? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. cool. Let's go. Okay, what are we looking at here, Silver? We're looking at one of the four uh, storage pounds we have here in Oranola Ag. What you see here, uh, it's baskets, mainly baskets, uh, that can contain uh, nine uh, used fuel per basket. And uh, all these uh, fuels will be recycled uh, and transferred to the process. Uh, in France, uh, in the past, we already produced 17% of uh, nuclear electricity uh, thanks to recycled materials and we are working on an R&D program today to uh, raise uh, to 30% of okay. recycled material, recycled electricity. That sounds pretty green. Yeah, it is. Not all of the waste can be recycled and the materials that can't are incorporated into stainless steel containers and placed into the floor in this temporary store. The store I'd seen at La Hague was only a temporary solution. The final resting place for France's nuclear waste is anticipated to be the Sigio project, a proposed deep geological disposal facility in eastern France. Half a kilometre underground, in the research laboratory for the project, I was shown around by Eric Poirot. So, Eric, can you tell me, I mean, how long has this underground lab been uh, operating? We began uh, the digging in 2001, and uh, we started studying the rock in 2005 during 15 years. So we learned about uh, this rock a lot. For example, this rock has a low permeability, very low permeability. It can contain uh, with uh, high efficiency uh, the right waste. So now, today, at this moment, we can say that it is suitable and ideal to uh, construct a repository. This uh, location will stay a lab, will remain a lab. Okay? The final repository uh, will be located around uh, five kilometers away from here, but at the same depth in the same rock. Okay, and presumably you're not just studying the geology, you're, are you 
studying the techniques and uh, equipment that would be yes. used to store the waste. We learn uh, about the digging itself, uh, which machine uh, we have to use uh, to dig in this uh, material, but also uh, how to choose the better support for the gallery, because uh, in the repository, the galleries will be bigger comparing to the lab, maybe right. six meters in diameter. So we have to test different kinds of support. Oh, wait, should we have a look at the next gallery? Yeah. Okay. I have something very special to show you. Okay. Uh, facing to you, you have a full-scale representation of what kind of cell will be used in the repository to push the primary canister, the high-activity canister, in the range. They are produced, as you know, uh, at LAG by Horano. We will receive it and pull it in this uh, liner with a pushing robot. And so the side, the size in this uh, representation is full scale. So full scale means that it is between 70 to 90 centimeters in diameter and 150 meters long. Yeah, so it's pretty amazing. I mean, what are we, half a kilometer underground? It seemed that France was years ahead of us. Could we follow their example? Back in the UK, I wanted to see if there were other Green Party members who, like me, were shifting their opinion on nuclear. I met up with Josh, a young Green who had come round to supporting nuclear energy. It, it really sounds like you've been on a pretty similar journey to, to that which I've been on. I was just wondering, um, could you sort of describe how you've come to the position that you have? So I've been a, a member of the party for around two and a half years now. To be honest, before I joined, I'd never really thought about energy policy or nuclear at all. And so kind of automatically had a, a soft objection to the idea. I think there's a, a really damaging gap between the rhetoric uh, as to why the party opposes nuclear and, and, and the evidence essentially. So especially around the, the issue of safety. I think if you, if you take in to account the context of the breakdown of the Earth's climate systems, right, and the extraordinarily damaging consequences that's already having across the world in, glo in the global south, and it's going to get worse over the, over the coming decades, the idea that we should just shut down or refuse to extend or refuse to build any new nuclear power, which is a, a clean and reliable energy source, uh, it seems to be an enormous an enormous overreaction. We've already seen in, in the likes of Germany and Belgium where they're shutting down nuclear plants early. What's happening? Well, they're using more coal and gas, making it even harder to achieve the ultimate goal, which is to decarbonize the entire economy as soon as possible. I agree. And I mean, I think what I've learned um, over the last six months is, um, you know, it's, it's all right to change your mind. Despite my party's opposition to nuclear, I have always felt that the Greens are the best people to lead the way to a sustainable future. After everything I'd learnt and seen, I had decided that nuclear was a viable option. So I started a campaign, Greens for Nuclear Energy. we commissioned an Ipsos poll. Within the poll, of over 3,300 people, we asked this question. Twenty-two percent of respondents stated that they were involved to some extent. We then asked this group another question.
53% of those involved in an environmental campaigning organisation said they supported the building of new nuclear plants. Only 9% of them supported my party's policy of strong opposition. It's clear to me now, being anti-nuclear isn't an option any longer. And as the climate emergency grows, environmentalists are increasingly seeing nuclear as part of the solution. Ultimately, the members are going to have to go through a similar journey as I made, where they need to recognise that renewable energies just won't reach the energy demands that are going to be in the future. And they will need to recognise that nuclear energy itself will be key to meeting those energy demands. I'm not pro-nuclear. I'm not anti-nuclear either. What I am is pro-evidence and pro the best possible solution to reach net zero as soon as we possibly can. In the end, we need to be pragmatic. We need to take the things that work and scale them up because we don't get a second chance on this. Since I began this journey, looking at the pros and cons of nuclear energy, I've tried to unpick how they stack up against the absolute need for us to eliminate fossil fuels. And for me, personally, there is no question about it. Nuclear energy has already averted the emission of many tens of billions of tonnes of greenhouse gases globally. And if we just permit it to, it can continue to do so. Now we don't all have to fall in love with nuclear and I do understand the concerns that some people might have. I've been there myself. And I accept that for some of us, supporting nuclear might feel like a step too far, but we are running out of time. There can be no compromise to combat climate change.